so this module is going to be on uh, patterning uh, proteins, cells, and, uh, and surface properties. So here's the problem that we're going to address in this module. How can we engineer the properties of a surface so that we can control where cells and biomolecules attach? So a fundamental uh, problem or thing that we'd like to do in, in biomems and microfluidics, uh, lab on a chip type devices, is to have these devices interact with cells. We'll analyze uh, different types of biomolecules and cells in these devices. We can grow um, we can grow cells in these types of devices. A lot of the uh, folks who are doing uh, tissue engineering and physiological systems are actually trying to grow uh, different types of cell types and certain organized patterns. Um, in some cases, it may be as simple as we want to make sure that the uh, cells or biomolecules do not attach to the surface. If you have um, an implant going in inside your body, for example, a neural probe or a pacemaker, in those types of situations, the devices as they are designed right now, we want to make sure that we don't, we want to make sure that proteins and cells do not attach to those devices. For example, in a neural probe, neural probes are these uh, electrical devices that are inserted into your brain. Um, and they, uh, um, and a voltage is applied to those electrodes. And that can be used to stimulate neurons and cause uh, action potentials to happen. Those electrodes can also be able to sense action potent potentials from the neurons around them. In those types of situations, if you insert the device, the, the, um, the body will elicit some type of immune response where there, there's different cell types that will go and attach themselves to the surface of the electrode. And over time, this will, um, it fouls the electrode and it, it causes the, um, the signals detected from the electrode to become weaker. Okay, so those are the types of situations where you would want to prevent the absorption of cells on surfaces. Um, and the opposite situation is where you want to actually grow the cells on a surface in places that you designate. So we're going to talk about examples of both, but um, you know, uh, in order to understand how we do that, we're going to be talking about a lot of surface chemistry. Okay. So like I said, it's going to be more chemistry focused than our previous lectures, which are more physics focused. Uh, this is a very interdisciplinary field, so you can imagine that it's it's good for you as engineers to be learning about these um, uh, different topics. Now, um, the downside of these types of uh, uh, fields, where it's, which is very interdisciplinary, is that you can never really go very in depth into any one topic. Okay, and that's just something we have to <laughs> we have to accept. In this uh, semester, we are going to be covering uh, a range of different topics. We're going to be going trying to go in depth as possible, but um, some of the things we won't be able to, you know, I won't be able to talk to you about. Uh, chemical reactions from first principles, for example. You know, we'll just do the best we can in terms of uh, how these types of chemistries are used in biomems devices. Okay. So, uh, again, getting back to this question, um, how can we engineer the properties of a surface and control where cells and biomolecules attach? Uh, so we're going to split this up into um, uh, three different subtopics. Uh, first, we're going to uh, talk about self-assembled monolayers. Uh, and these self-assembled uh, monolayers can be used to control the surface properties of, uh, of an engineered device. For example, we can make some areas of the device hydrophobic, other areas of the device hydrophilic. We'll talk more about that as we go. Uh, self-assembled monolayers are uh, single layers of molecules that attach to the surface. And depending on what types of molecules those are, they can they'll uh, infer or confer different surface properties on different properties onto the surface. We'll get get to that. You can pattern self-assembled monolayers using uh, soft lithography, by photolithography, and uh, numerous other techniques. We'll talk a lot about the chemistry of self-assembled monolayers in this uh, chapter. Next, we'll talk about how we can pattern biomolecules. Okay, the first thing, self-assembled monolayers could be uh, considered engineering, um, patterning surface chemistry. So patterning the properties of the surface. The second one is where we're patterning actual biomolecules, uh, specifically proteins. We can chemisorb proteins, where uh, proteins form a covalent bond with the surface, or you can physisorb proteins, which, uh, uh, which is the, just the physical adsorption of proteins on, uh, on the surface. 
And then uh, the last part of this module will talk about uh, cell micropatterning. How can we tell how can we tell the cells only to attach to certain regions of the uh, surface? Uh, and in, you know, as we go through these topics, you'll see about different examples of where patterning uh, patterning biomolecules is used for various applications. <clears throat> So let's go um, down to some very basic principles. Start with that. So the two mechanisms by which we can attach uh, biomolecules to a substrate. And the first one is physisorption. The second one is chemisorption. So physisorption is the spontaneous adherence of a molecule uh, to a surface uh, through a, a things like van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces, hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions. Uh, and this physisorption phenomena can be inhibited by uh, solvents, for example, ethanol. So let's talk about a few of these things. Uh, so some of you are familiar from physics about these different forces that uh, forces between molecules. So um, things like van der Waals forces can be used to attach molecules to a surface. Uh, electrostatic Interactions can be used to attach molecules to a surface. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say you have a surface that is negatively charged. In glass, for example, uh, I mentioned this in class last time. One of the uh, consistent properties of glass is that uh, if you take uh, a pure glass and you put it, uh, you put it under water, the glass acquires a negative charge. So the surface is negatively charged. Now, a positively charged ion or a positively charged protein or molecule will go and attach to that surface of the glass through um, uh, electrostatic interactions. Okay. But um, electrostatic interactions can be pretty complex because um, when you're in liquid, there are other ions in the liquid too. So depending on the ionic concentration of the liquid, this can disrupt the bonding. And I'll show you what I mean by um, just a quick diagram here. Um, sometimes my pen uh, stops working. I just need to reset it. Okay. So let's say we have a ch channel like this, and this channel is made of, of glass. And so the glass acquires a negative charge on the surface. Um, now, positively charged molecule, if you're in deionized water, let's say this is di water, and then you have a positively charged protein. We'll just call that plus P. So obviously, this positively charged protein will have electrostatic, uh, will be electrostatically attracted to the surface of the glass, so the protein will uh, physisorb to the surface there. Okay, the, the point I want to bring up is that if they, let's say there are, um, let's say you change the ionic strength of the water. Let's say instead of deionized water, you have this, um, uh, you have a salt solution, so NaCl, right, salt water. So in that case, you're going to have a bunch of Na plus ions here, and you're going to have a bunch of uh, negative chloride ions there, right? These ions are obviously going to, um, can also interact with the surface, right? And um, the negatively charged ions can interact with the positively charged molecule. So without getting into the details of all that, you, you can see how the salt concentration will, can affect the ability of this protein to bind to the surface, right? So when we're talking about electrostatic interactions, it really does depend on the ionic concentration of the, the liquid. So it's much more complex than simple Coulombic interactions that you had in, have in vacuum. In vacuum, you just have positive and negative charges attracted to one another. Uh, hydrogen bonding can also play a role. Um, if you're in a water, uh, you know, if the, the, most of the chemistries that we work with are aqueous chemistries. You know, they happen in water. Um, now, hydrogen bonding is, you know, you ha is something that has to do with the structure of water. A water molecule looks something like this. You have an oxygen and two hydrogens like this. 
If you remember from chemistry a concept called electronegativity, does anyone remember that? It's been a while. Okay, Nick, <laughs> what is electronegativity? Um, uh, some atoms play neg or negative or positive. Um, I don't know, or polar. So, I don't know, hydrogens are positive and oxygen is negative. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the hydrogen molecules are, are positive, the oxygen. The hydrogen molecules um, acquire a net positive charge. Let's just put this in parentheses. And the oxygen acquires a net negative charge. This is because oxygen is more electronegative than uh, hydrogen is. So these bonds, each one of these lines here represents covalent bond. So there's two electrons in there. Um, what ends up happening is that the electrons spend more time near the oxygen than they do near the hydrogen. Statistically, they spend more time uh, towards the oxygen. Because of that, the uh, oxygen acquires a, um, a net negative charge and the, um, uh, uh, the hydrogen molecules acquire net positive charge. This is why um, Water is is a polar molecule. A polar molecule is a molecule that has positive charge. You know that it has a. Um, it's not a symmetric molecule. It 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 has a net positive charge on one side, and a net negative charge on the other side. The definition of a polar molecule is a molecule that has positive and negative parts to it. All right, so um, there's more, uh, you know, uh, if you have an um, extra hydrogen ion in the solution, the hydrogen ion can actually have some binding with, uh, with the negatively charged um, oxygen, forming something called a hydronium ion. And those interactions can also cause uh, differences in uh, fizz absorption of molecules on a surface. And then uh, the last one is hydrophobic interactions. This is something important to understand just because it, it just comes up all the time. Now, um, how can we draw this? So let's say we have a surface here. And this surface is hydrophobic. Now you have a protein, we'll call this P, and let's say the protein is also hydrophobic. Uh, what is uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic? Water -hating, water -loving. Yeah, water hating, water loving. So hydrophobic means the, um, the molecule or surface does not like water. Uh, typically hydrophobic surfaces are nonpolar. And uh, the opposite is hydrophilic. Hydrophilic surfaces, hydrophilic molecules like to be around water. Um, this is because the molecule or surface has some charged groups or polar groups. And um, the polar nature of water molecules, like, the, um, like molecules tend to um, uh, be with like molecules, meaning like polar uh, molecules will prefer to be with polar molecules, nonpolar molecules will prefer to be with nonpolar molecules. So um, if the surface, for example, is, is nonpolar, meaning it doesn't have any type of charge on it, then that surface will be hydrophobic. So a hydrophobic protein will actually come and um, uh, interact with the surface, it'll actually, uh, um, it'll fizzysorb to the surface. So let's make a note, this is a hydrophobic, hydrophobic protein. So, um, in order to understand this, uh, why this happens, it's useful to just, let's say we have two hydrophobic proteins, or two hydrophobic molecules, however you want to think about it. We have them in a, um, we have them in a beaker of water, like this. Okay. The water molecules, I'll just draw them as arrows. So the water molecules are attracted to one another. 
because the negative parts of the water, water molecule are attracted to the positive parts of other water molecules. This is what's referred to as sort of like hydrogen bonding. Right? Some parts of the water molecule is negative. Other parts of the water molecule are positive. All right? So if you have a water molecule and this is the negative portion of it, this will want to interact with the positive portion of another water molecule. Right? So this is one water molecule, this is another water molecule. The negative portion of a water molecule interacts with the positive portion of another water molecule. So this is one of the reasons why polar molecules tend to like other polar molecules. So let's say this happens in solution. You have a bunch of these water molecules. Um, now, um, this diagram is showing that these water molecules will um, interact with one another. Right? The negative and positive portions interact with one another. So what happens is that a, a protein like this, two proteins that are hydrophobic, they will actually be squeezed together by the interactions of the water molecules around it. All right. So they'll be literally be pushed together like this, and they'll be surrounded by other water molecules. Okay, so the way that you can think about this is that these water molecules surrounding the proteins are attracted to one another through hydrogen bonding or these polar interactions. These things are, as they're, uh, since they're attracted to one another, they form sort of a shell, it's called a hydration shell, around these protein molecules. And those protein molecules are kind of like squeezed together like this. So, I mean, the basic rule of thumb is this, is that, like, if you have hydrophobic, um, if you have hydrophobic molecules in a hydrophilic solution, right, like, if you have proteins in water, those proteins will actually aggregate, they'll clump together, and they'll also attach themselves to the surface for the same reason. This is what a hydrophobic interaction is. Hydrophobic molecules tend to be pushed up against other hydrophobic molecules. Just by the fact that you have these water molecules around it, the water molecules like each other, and they're trying to come together, and they end up pushing together the hydrophobic molecules. It's a very qualitative description of what hydrophobic interactions are. Uh, any questions on this? Does that hydration show how Did, say that again? A hydration shell, does it have like a loose reaction, loose connection or reaction around it? Uh, yeah, the, the hydration shell around it, so these water molecules are kind of attracted to other water molecules around it through that polar bonding. So there's no covalent bond between them. There's just those electrostatic interactions between the, the positively and negatively charged portions of the water molecule. That's what's referred to as hydrogen bonding. Um, the fact that you have these hydrogens here and the, the oxygen is much more electronegative, that's what creates a polar nature. And um, in, in water, there's a large difference in electronegativity between these positive and negative regions. So it makes those, it makes those, in, uh, those uh, interactions very strong. So that's why they some, sometimes refer to those things as hydrogen bonding. It's not a strict covalent bond, but it's sort of a bond. All right, so uh, I think that diagram covers a little bit of hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interactions. So physisorption is the adherence of a molecule to a surface or even the adherence of a molecule to another molecule um, that doesn't involve any, any covalent bonds or chemical bonds. It just involves um, basic, or not basic, but um, just these uh, uh, um, physical mechanisms. So... Chemisorption, by contrast, is, has to do with uh, covalent bonds. So in the case of chemisorption, the protein is actually so you have some type of surface here. 
the protein is actually um, attaching itself to some chemistry on the surface. So there's a chemical bond there. So you can imagine that, that chemisorption, since it involves a covalent bond, since it involves a chemical bond, once that protein is attached, it's going to be very strongly attached. So chemisorption has that advantage over uh, physisorption, is that once the chemical is, once a molecule is immobilized on the surface, that bond is, is strong. So even if you wash it, even if you wash it away, even if you change the temperature, you know, there's, uh, even if you sonicate it, like the, the molecules will not come off. With physisorption, it is possible to link once a molecule has absorbed, there's different absorption strengths, you know, if it's not a very strong absorption, you can actually remove the proteins by uh, changing the pH, for example, or changing the temperature, um, mechanically vibrating the thing to shake the proteins off, sometimes adding surfactants like soap. You know, <laughs> you know when, when, when you have like, um, 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 you know, like, uh, <laughs> here's a good example of protein. So I, I have protein shakes. I don't know if any of you drink protein shakes. Yeah. <laughs> So you know how like the, uh, those proteins really they really stick to the to the walls of uh, your glass. That's through physisorption. Right? Proteins absorb to a bunch of surfaces through basically these mechanisms, and they they tend to absorb very strongly because proteins have have charges on them, so they they have electrostatic bonding. They have a lot of hydrophobic regions, so they have hydrophobic interactions. There's uh, van der Waals and forces and, and hydrogen bonding involved too. Like you're always you know, when you make your protein shake, it's in water, right? So there's hydrogen bonding effects there, too. The point I was, I was going with that is, like, you know, by adding a surfactant and by scrubbing it, you can remove the protein deposits from, the, from, the, from your glass, right? <laughs> but if, there, if it's chemisorption, then it'll be much more difficult to remove because there's actual bond forming. So uh, examples, uh, you know, covalent bonds, self assembled monolayers, which involve bonding, uh, these are examples of chemisorption. So we talked about how molecules attach to surfaces. Now we can talk a little bit about how cells attach to surfaces, just so we have like the, the basic principles here. All right, now uh, again, I have to say like that the stuff we're going over on this slide is a very basic description. Um, you know, cell biologists could spend their entire career studying on how, how cells attach to surfaces. But these, these are some of the basic concepts that have been uh, understood. Um, and they seem to uh, um, they seem to be conserved across various types of organisms. Uh, so first, let me say this: is that within the body, cells attach to extracellular matrix, which is uh, like a, a mesh of proteins. So in the body, uh, I guess we could just draw draw a mesh kind of like this as. Uh, sort of a, a mesh network here. Now cells, th this is referred to as ECM, and the cells, uh, if we can draw these guys in blue here, they actually attach to different parts of this um, ECM. This is what happens inside your body. It turns out that the attachment of the cells to this ECM is very important in how the cell functions. To the point where if the cell cannot attach to anything, it'll die. Now I want to differentiate between two cell types. Okay, so I'll write this down here. Two cell types. There's the uh, prokaryotic. No, prokaryotes, and then we have the eukaryotes. So prokaryotes are um, typically like bacteria, are prokaryotes, and then mammalian cells like human cells, and you know other types of animal cells are eukaryotes. Now um, I'm not going to go into all the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes right now. Um, We'll save that for another day. But uh, for right now, let's just say that one of, um, since we're talking about cell attachment, 
um, eukaryotes are the ones that need to attach to something in order for them to survive. <clears throat> eukaryotes tend to be part of higher order organisms, although so that you can you can have individual eukaryotic cells too. Yeast, for example, is a eukaryotic uh, organism. But a lot of like mammalian cells. Let, let me just say m mammalian cells. Mammalian cells. Um, you know, we are not single-celled organisms. We have like we're made up of like billions or trillions of cells, and those cells have to work together. Okay. And the way that they attach themselves in the body is, is through extracellular matrix. They actually send signals uh, between one another to tell each other when to grow and when not to grow. Cancer is when a cell grows uncontrollably. There's a lot of communication that happens, and one of the pieces of communication is the cell attaching to something, cell, cell attaching to a matrix. Now, uh, prokaryotes, just to draw the difference, a prokaryotic cell is a bacteria cell, for example. E. coli, you know, the type of um, a bacteria that causes stomach problems. Prokaryotes do not require attachment. They do not require attachment to cells. To something. So prokaryotes can be, you know, swimming on their own in uh, um, in water, right? They can, you know, whenever you have puddles of water, E. coli can. Uh, generate in there and then they reproduce and so on. Prokaryotes generally do not require any kind of attachment to an extracellular matrix. Eukaryotes, a lot of eukaryotes do, like I said. There are some eukaryotes that do not, but um, mammalian cells, for example, require um, attachment to ECF. So mammalian cells are human cells are part of um, uh, a uh, eukaryotic type of cell. An example of a prokaryotic type of cell would be uh, E. coli or other bacteria. So when we're understanding how cells attach to surfaces, well, when we're dealing with uh, mammalian cells, uh, we have to be we're interested in the chemistry of the extracellular matrix, the ECM, and how the cell specifically attaches to that ECM. So this slide shows a little bit about that. All right, so uh, the ECM is a, uh, a mesh of proteins and uh, polysaccharides. A saccharide is a, is a basic building block of sugar. So when you have polysaccharides, it's multiple blocks of sugar. Uh, the way that cells attach to the ECM is through a family of proteins called in integrins. The diagram of it is, is shown here. Okay, this is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. Okay, the inside of the cell we call the cytoplasm. Uh, I should have a diagram of cell. I'll show you next time. Uh, So, I think I'm out of batteries. Maybe that's the problem. So, there are different parts of the cell. Right now, let's just talk about, you know, the outside of the cell is called the cell membrane. drawing the cell as a circle, but uh, cells often don't take the shape of a circle. The outside of the cell is called the membrane. The internal part of the, uh, the liquid inside the cell is called the uh, cytosol, the cytoplasm. 
And then within the cell, you have another region, which is called the nucleus. The nucleus is where all the DNA, the genetic code for the cell, lives in the nucleus. The cytosol and the cytoplasm is the internal chemical contents of the cell. And then there's a cell membrane that prevents the cytosol and the cytoplasm from spilling out into the extracellular space. This is called the outside of the cell is called the extra extracellular space. Within the extracellular space, there's uh, ECM extracellular matrix, those proteins. So the cell has to attach to the extracellular space, to those ECM proteins, uh, through, um, we'll draw this as a sort of a dumbbell shape here, through these things called integrins. So the integrin, we call it, we call it a, uh, a transmembrane protein. It's called a transmembrane protein because it spans the cell membrane. Part of it is on the inside of the cell, part of it is on the outside of the cell. The part on the outside of the cell is what attaches to the ECM protein. Okay, there's a, a binding that happens here. That's what this slide is actually uh, going into the details of. So if you look at this uh, graph here, um, oh, let's look at this one first. So this is an example of a cell, a, a non-adherent cell. You can see it has like a, a circular, uh, it appears circular. And in fact, a lot of the cells, if they're not attaching properly, they'll appear, appear circular in the microscope, and then you'll know something's wrong with the cell. Um, a properly working um, a cell which attaches, they will, um, uh, it will uh, form these uh, uh, processes, and these processes attach to the uh, extracellular matrix underneath it. Uh, these little processes, are um, the ends are called focal adhesion points. So there are many points where the cell sort of anchors itself to the surface. Each one of those anchors is referred to as a focal adhesion point. And so the cell adopts more like a um, more like a pancake type shape. It looks kind of like the sunny side up. We have the nucleus here in the middle, and then it's sort of spread out over. Here. So there's an att uh, several attachment points, and it turns out the cell can actually walk. You know, it can um, it can actuate itself. It keeps um, it may remove one of these focal adhesion points, and um, uh, then it sort of slides over like this, and then it adds another focal adhesion point on this side. So it sort of slithers back and forth. Okay. Now, in order to do that, it has something. It's, it has an internal part called the cytoskeleton. And going back to this diagram, this, the cytosol and the cytoplasm actually has a network. We'll draw these in um, blue. It actually has a network of fibers inside of it. Okay, um, called the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is composed of filaments, actin filaments, like strings of, um, which can form rigid structures. Okay, so the inside of the cell can become rigid at times. It, the cell is able to construct those actin filaments and deconstruct those actin filaments at will. So, um, you know, parts of the cell can be rigid while other parts remain non-rigid. It's, it's very cool, and there's, there's, scientists are still trying to understand how these actin filaments work, when they're generated, and when, when they're not. Um, you know, there, there's a lot more information I could give you on that, but, uh, you know, we don't have quite enough time. I just want to explain that um, these focal adhesion points are actually attached to the internal cytoskeleton of the cell. Okay. Now, so you have the cytoplasm here. This diagram is showing what the um, the integrin proteins look like and what the ECM uh, looks like. Uh, so this is the cytoplasm. This is inside the cell. 
Inside the cell, you have the cytoskeleton, which is composed of these actin filaments. Um, now, parts of this cytoskeleton or, uh, or the filaments can attach to these things called um, the beta, the, the integrins. There's a few different types of integrins. This is showing the alpha and the beta. These are transmembrane proteins, meaning part of the protein is outside the cell, part of the protein is inside the cell. The part that is inside is what attach, attaches to the actin filament. Okay. The part on the outside of the cell attaches to the ECM protein. So this is what is anchoring the cell to the protein. Each one of these connections here is referred to as a focal adhesion point, or just focal adhesions. Okay, I call them FAs. There will be multiple uh, focal adhesions for a certain type of cell. Okay, the cell membrane is also referred to as a, as a plasma membrane. Uh, questions? Okay, a little bit more about the chemistry here. The, um, the ECM contains a well-known peptide sequence called RGD, uh, which, uh, to which integrins can, can bind. So RGD is also found in fiber, actin, and collagen. So the reason why this RGD thing is, is very, um, it's, uh, why it's mentioned here is because uh, um, if you could create um, a surface that has, that presents these RGD molecules, the surface that has RGD molecules, then uh, you can trick the cell into thinking that's extracellular matrix, right? Because extracellular matrix is also presenting those groups. So any surface that has some of these RGD uh, sequences, peptide sequences, cells will tend to attach those sequences. Okay. Um, you can actually buy um, extracellular like matrix-like substances. You can um, there's something called matrigel, for example. You can just buy them commercially, um, but um, there's other things too, like if you have proteins like fibronectin and collagen, these materials, if they're coated on something, cells will attach to those surfaces and be fine. Okay, so there's um, a lot of uh, a lot of chemistries that we have available that allow us to um, to uh, um, basically engineer those attachments. Another thing, which is interesting, is cells can secrete their own ECM proteins. Since cells like to um, um, cells are interested in self-preservation. Uh, they will often secrete their own um, ECM proteins and attach themselves to those ECM proteins. There are certain cells that are actually responsible for creating the extracellular matrix and maintaining the extracellular matrix. As I mentioned before, so without this type of adhesion, a lot of uh, mammalian cell types will undergo apoptosis, which is called programmed cell death. It's when a cell basically commits suicide. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that in the body, like when uh, certain cell types, when a, a cell has reached its its age, a certain time, it, it automatically will um, uh, kill itself. Um, I, I won't get into all the details right now. Um, so this last part here is just showing some, like really, you know, some beautiful images of uh, what cells look like when they attach. You know, you can see uh, uh, in this image here. This is a fluorescent image where where the actin filaments were stained. So you could actually see the different parts of the cytoskeleton. This is what confirms, these are the types of images that confirms that there is in fact a cytoskeleton within the cell. Okay, under a regular light microscope, you only see a big blob that looks like a cell. But um, there are certain stains or, or fluorescent molecules that you can get that will attach themselves only to actin and they'll cause those areas of the cell to light up. Um, there are other molecules which will attach only to the nucleus. You can see where the nucleus of the cells are. Okay, so you can see that these cells form all sorts of interesting structures. Um, these are sometimes referred to as processes, um, where the cell will basically stretch out, you know, one um, process in one direction, form a focal adhesion there, and that is kind of like a suction cup. Then the cell will let go uh, another part of it, and it'll drag itself over towards that focal adhesion. It'll kind of repeat this process, sort of cra crawling in a certain direction like, sp like Spider-Man. Um, and there are many mess chemical messengers and, and things like that that help uh, signaling, that help mediate which direction a cell would like to go and so on. Uh, this is a, a model, if you're interested in this stuff, is it, there's a model called Tensegrity uh, that was um, uh, uh, described by uh, Donald Ingber where they showed that the internal of a cell 
is is uh, is can be modeled by a sense that where you have these like um, rigid rods that are connected by these uh, filaments. Okay, so this is like a, a mechanical model of the cell, if you will. <clears throat> so that's a, a little bit about cell biology, very little, and how, how they can attach to surfaces. Uh, we're going to uh, change gears for a second here and then now talk about um, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic surfaces. Uh, so now we're getting into self-assembled monolayers. Okay, so in terms of topics, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about biomolecules and cell uh, patterning later. We just first started off by talking about how proteins can attach, how cells can attach. Now we're going to go into details on self-assembled monolayers. Self-assembled monolayers can be used to pattern surface chemistry. Certain regions can have a certain uh, surface properties associated with it, and other regions can have other surface properties associated with it. Now when um, uh, uh, chemists often talk about surface properties, the first thing that often pops to mind is whether the surface is hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. So we mentioned that hydrophilic means it's water-loving. Hydrophobic means it's water-fearing or water-hating. How do you know if a surface is hydrophobic or hydrophilic? You can do uh, contact angle measurements. Okay, hydrophobicity is quantified by the contact angle. The reason why uh, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity is very important is that the, a lot of biochemistry uh, on a surface depends on whether the, the surface is hydrophilic or hydrophobic. A lot of things depend on that. So uh, the first thing we think of when we think of surface properties, we think about hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. Uh, if you were to put a drop of water on a surface, <clears throat> um, you can measure something called the contact angle, okay, and that contact angle tells you whether um, the, the surface, you know, the degree of hydrophobicity. You can see on this chart here. Uh, something that's very hydrophilic will have a small contact angle. The contact angle is measured from the plane of the surface to um, if you look at one of the edges of the drop, that, that edge will form an angle. Okay? If that angle is less than 90 degrees, then the, uh, um, the surface is referred to as hydrophilic or, or um, uh, water-loving. Okay? Now, you can think about this is that the, the water molecules like being near the surface of the glass, and that's one of the reasons why the contact angle is small. Okay, so you have a lot of the surface that's being covered by these water molecules. So if there's some water molecules here, it likes being near the surface. So um, if this, if this material surface was super hydrophilic, these water molecules that are sitting here are so attracted to the surface that they'll actually try to just occupy this space here. The water molecules like being near the surface in a hydrophilic surface. So they'll try to cover as much of the surface as possible. So this droplet, if, if from going from a hydrophilic to a super hydrophilic surface, this will actually spread out even more, and the contact angle will be even smaller. So if, um, you know, one rule of thumb is that if a surface uh, forms less than a five degree contact angle in half a second, then it's referred to as a super hydrophilic surface. Hydrophilic, the standard hydrophilic surface is just referred to as when the contact angle is less than 90 degrees. So you have an acute angle here. If the uh, surface is hydrophobic, then more of the water is going to try to stay away from the surface, not in contact with the surface. And uh, a droplet will actually end up looking something like this. So you'll actually end up having an obtuse angle greater than 90 degrees. So a hydrophobic material would be something, you know, if we were to define uh, numbers here, 90 degrees to 150 degrees would be considered hydrophobic. Super hydrophobic is where, um, you know, you have a, a very large angle here. So getting close to 180 degrees. And in this case, you can see that the droplet would take a spherical shape. So there are examples of super hydrophobic materials in nature. And in fact, a lot of the super hydrophobic materials that we have now are inspired by nature. In a lotus petal, okay, a lotus petal is actually a hydrophobic material. The surface on its own is hydrophobic, but there are also these little ridges 
Okay, the surface is not flat. There's actually like these little, it's there's a rough, it's a roughened surface. It turns out that the roughening of the surface makes the material, makes a hydrophobic material even more hydrophobic. And it will make a hydrophilic material even more hydrophilic. In the last homework, you had this example where, um, you know, in the homework that you're doing right now, uh, where you, you're looking at the effects of surface area. If a surface is roughened, what happens to the surface area? It increases, right. In your example that you had in the homework, you, we roughened, quote, roughened the surface by just putting carbon nanotubes on there, right? And you found that the surface area increases quite, quite dramatically, right? When you increase the surface area, surface effects become more significant. So this contact angle phenomena is a surface-driven uh, phenomena. So you can enhance this phenomena by increasing the surface area. One way of increasing the surface area is to roughen the surface. Instead of having a flat surface, you have something that has um, you know, additional structures in it so that more surface area is exposed. So people have used these types of tricks. If you want to get a super hydrophilic material, just take a hydrophilic material and um, then um, roughen the surface. So you have these little ridges. Now these little ridges, because there's so much surface here, the water molecules like the surfaces so much, the more ridges you have, those ridges anchor the water to the surface. So this droplet that was here, if you were to turn this 90 degrees and try to get gravity to pull the droplet down, um, as long as the droplet isn't too big, it, it will actually hold it there. Um, if you just have a regular hydrophilic material, it might, it might slide, slide down the surface. But in the case of a super hydrophilic material, you'll actually hold them in. Now, um, there's a model for this. You know, we're not going to go into the details of it, but just so you know, like there's, they have uh, different models for um, surfaces which are roughened. Okay, this uh, uh, the contact angle is equal to the R, which is the um, uh, it's a, a parameter related to the surface roughness times the uh, original contact angle. Now you can do the same thing for a hydrophobic surface and make it super hydrophobic by just roughening the surface. And something interesting that happens here is that um, the water droplet will actually sit on top of the posts, and there'll be like it'll there'll be a bed of air underneath it. The water molecule will, because of surface tension, this water won't actually go all the way into the um, into these regions. Because these water molecules don't like this surface, the water molecules would, pr would prefer not to be near this area where there's so much surface exposed. All right, so the roughening of the surface, uh, you know, it's, it's quantitatively given by this model. We're not going to talk about that, but just, just so you know, um, this makes the, it increases the contact angle the more rough the surface is. So that's what happens in the, like, lotus leaf effect. You know, you, you guys have seen, like, uh, uh, photography of this, you've seen movies of this where you know, the drops of water literally roll off the surface of the lotus leaf. You know, they, they look like balls rolling. And in fact, that's, that's more or less what happens. The ball will, uh, the droplets form balls and they just roll down the surface like this. Okay, because the contact angle is high. Um, in the case of a hydrophilic material, the, the droplet can still go across the surface if you turn, if you turn the surface 90 degrees. But it's actually being dragged along the surface. In the case of the hydrophobic, surface, it actually just rolls right off. Okay. So good, you know, good raincoats will also do this, like things like Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex is like a, um, it's a, it's a hydrophobic material that's also, it has, uh, um, it's roughened, it, it has a texture to it, and it's also breathable. So if you notice, like, you know, water droplets will just roll right off um, certain materials like that. All right. Yes. Can you put rain inside your roof? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not super hydrophobic, but it's it's making your it's making the glass hydrophobic. So glass on its own is negatively charged. So if it's negatively charged, what do you think is going to happen? Is it going to be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? negatively charged surface. So the way that we think about this is that to say a water molecule is polar, right? So it has positive and negative parts to it. 
if you have a charged surface, that polar molecule can interact with the surface, right? So for that reason, glass is actually hydrophilic because water molecules can interact with the surface. They're attracted to the surface. So glass on its own is hydrophilic, but you can make glass hydrophobic by applying stuff like Rain-X. Rain is actually, a, it's, a, it's a material that, um, it's actually kind of like a self-assembled monolayer. We'll talk about it. So the, the uh, uh, Rain-X and, and things like that, they, they're an amphiphilic molecule. Um, Say this is glass. Um, we can draw an amphiphilic molecule like this. It has a polar. It's a molecule that has a polar head group and a nonpolar tail. Okay. It has two parts to it. So the polar parts like being near the glass. So when you expose that molecule to the glass. The, the molecule actually organizes itself. It self-assembles on the surface of the glass, meaning like the polar parts. The polar part likes the glass because the glass is negatively charged. That side of the molecule will attach itself to the glass, and the non-polar non part will be sticking out. So now essentially what you've done, glass on its own has a negatively charged surface, so glass on its own is hydrophilic. Now by putting this monolayer on the glass, now it's exposed. It's all these nonpolar groups. Nonpolar groups are hydrophobic. So we've essentially switched the properties of glass from hydrophilic to hydrophobic by applying a coating to it. So now this is, now the surface is hydrophobic. So questions? It also seems to it also seems to break the water molecule down, like the graph, like the little beads, like what was that other example that one we looked at, like basically a small sphere, it's in the small beads setting. I mean, so we take a droplet, we make it into a smaller set. So when the rain hits your window with the rain, it's uh -huh. looking like a bigger sphere of those small spheres. Oh, the, the large drop breaks up into smaller ones. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's breaking up just because of the impact of a large raindrop on the glass. But um, the, the beating happens because, uh, basically because of this. You know, when, when the surface is, when the surface is hydrophobic, you'll form, like, the water will beat like this. And if it's hydrophilic, it'll just more or less streak. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's a, you bring that up, that's a good point, because it, it's, it's a great example of where we want to engineer the surface properties. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, 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 press recently about this super hydrophobic uh, surface. Um, and and some of the videos that they were showing on it, like where this could be useful, was in ketchup bottles. <laughs> you know, like in a ketchup bottle, you know, you take it, you, you turn it upside down, right? There's still ketchup sticking to the top of the bottle, right? If you have a ketchup bottle with a super hydrophobic surface, then ketchup will not stick to the walls of the bottle. It'll just come right down. So they were talking about how, like, tons and tons of ketchup are wasted by Americans every year because we don't... We don't fully empty our ketchup bottles. <laughs> so um, surface engineering can uh, can help with problems like that. Okay, so that's not I don't know I didn't see that as a as a problem that's that's killing our society. But you know if we can save some ketchup, great. <laughs> they found some other very nice examples of the um, uses of super hydrophobic surfaces um, later on. For example, I think in um, in uh, devices, in, in systems that are riding on, on the surface of water, if the material is made of a hydrophobic material, there's less friction. It just goes easier. Things like that, easier. <clears throat> All 
All right, so let's uh, talk now about self-assembled model errors. And we're going a lot slower than I thought we would, but that's okay. Uh, self-assembled model errors, um, you know, this particular thing that I just showed you would be the ex example of a self-assembled self model error. Self-assembled means it assembles itself. Model error means it's just one layer of molecules, one atomic layer. All right, so in terms of chemistry, how what happens here, I already mentioned that um, polar molecules are attracted to charged and polar surfaces. Nonpolar molecules are attracted, are through hydrophobic interactions, are attracted to other nonpolar regions, hydrophobic regions. So we put a bunch of these molecules into the solution, right? We put this, you know, we have our surface, our substrate here. That's the thing we want to coat. Let's say this is glass. And then we just put this in a solution of all these molecules. Okay. We spent a long time talking about top-down manufacturing techniques where we say, like, I want to put this material here. I want to etch this region here, you know, using photolithography and things like that. We're doing top-down manufacturing. Chemists like to think of manufacturing or assembly in terms of bottoms up. Meaning, like, let's use the properties of the molecules themselves to create a certain structure. And the most basic and the most fundamental way that people think of doing that is by self-assembled monolayers. So um, I, I just mentioned that polar groups like to atta uh, attract, are attracted to other polar groups. So these molecules in solution, when they attach, they're going to actually reorient themselves and attach themselves like this. The polar group is going to attach to the surface of the glass. The nonpolar group will remain exposed. When the next molecule will come in here and, and attach itself to the surface. And over time, you're going to end up with just a bunch of molecules lined up like this on the surface. OK, this is self-assembly. Now, once, you know, you can imagine that these nonpolar groups, you're not going to be able to attach the polar head groups to these nonpolar areas. So the beautiful thing that happens is, is only a single layer of atoms deposits itself on the surface, regardless of how long you have the, uh, um, the, the, this thing under underwater. So independent of the reaction time. So it's a chemis... Uh, um, now... The example that I showed you was an example of physisorption, right? It was just the, the amphiphilic molecules attaching themselves to the surface. There was no bonding involved. Self-assembled monolayers takes this one step further, where you can also do chemisorption. So let's go into the details of how this works. So typically, you'll start off with the surface. Now, in the example I was giving you, it was glass. But um, another common chemistry is, is a surface of metal. You want to attach molecules, you want to create a self-assembled monolayer to the surface of gold, let's say. Gold and palladium are often used. Um, uh, silver and copper can also be used, but they can be toxic to cells. Um, let's... Okay. There's some mod, uh, modifications I made to the slide that didn't show up properly. So let me just go by memory here. So first of all, you have a metal substrate. So you, the surface, the surface is metal. Okay. It can be gold or silver. Now this portion here is the um, uh, is called the ligand or the head group of the uh, self-assembled model layer. Uh, this head group attaches itself to the metal using covalent bonds. Okay, the chemistry that I'm talking about is what's called this alkane thiol chemistry. Okay, just uh, ignore this for the time being. One end of the molecule, the molecule that attaches to the metal, has this SH group on it. Okay, uh, this SH group can form what's called a sulfhydro bond to the surface of the metal. So the sulfur group attaches forms a covalent bond with the metal. 
So this side of the molecule attaches to the metal surface. The molecule also contains this middle region here, which is called a spacer. Okay, this can just be a chain of carbon molecules or something else, but often it's, it's, a, it's alkane, which is a chain of carbon molecules. That serves as a spacer. That makes the molecule kind of long, you know, long and thin. Then on the other end, you have a terminal functional group. Now, this functional group is what determines the properties of the self-assembled monolayer after it has been assembled. Okay, so if you want your self-assembled monolayer to be hydrophilic, you, you, you make sure that this terminal group is, is a hydrophilic or charged group. If you want it to be hydrophobic, you can, have, um, you can just have a methyl group with a CH4 group. That, that'll keep it hydro, relatively hydrophobic. Okay? So the three parts of it, you have the ligand, which attaches to the surface, you have the spacer, and then you have the terminal functional group, which determines the properties, the, the surface properties that you'd like. Now, the nice thing is that you can build different self-assembled monolayers, you know, step by step. You can say, well, I want to attach this self-assembled monolayer to gold, so I'm going to make sure that my, my ligand in my head group contains a thiol chemistry, because thiol chemistry is attached to gold. Um, then I could say, well, I want this, um, after the self-assembled monolayer attaches, I would like to have the surface be hydrophobic, so I'll attach a methyl group here. Um, you can even get more complicated than that. You can say, you can attach RGD sequences to these terminal functional groups, so cells can attach to them. That way cells will only attach to the regions where the self, where the SAM self-assembled monolayer has been patterned. All right, so it's a very nice way to engineer the surface properties of, uh, uh, of a material. So two chemistries here. Um, I mentioned metal. So alkane thiols uses this SH chemistry to this side attaches to the metal. And this, is the, um, uh, this would be like the terminal group. In this case, it's OH. So OH is, is a, has a negative charge associated. It would be hydrophilic. Um, this is another example of a cell assembly model layer which attaches to glass or silicon instead of, um, instead of attaching to metal. So in this case, uh, you have this um, SiCl3 group here. Now this, uh, what ends up happening here is that the silicon attaches to the OH groups on the glass. So I mentioned glass is a negatively, negatively charged. Those negative charges are coming from these OH groups that end up having a negative charge. Um, so the silicon can react with those and form a covalent bond with those. And so this, this is another type of self-assembled monolayer molecule. This is called an alkyl silane. The other one is called alkane thiol. So in, in, in this case, just as an example, the head group is a, a methyl, CH3. And this would be uh, give the uh, SAM a hydrophilic property. So you can interchange. You, could, um, you can combine this SH with a CH3 head group, and you could um, combine this one with an OH head group. So you can make, you can basically engineer surface properties using self-assembled monolayers. As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the idea is that self-assembled monolayers assemble themselves. So um, the blue regions here were the, uh, what's were the ligands or the head groups, and the red regions here are the, the terminal functional groups. So um, the, the terminal group, if you modify the terminal group, you can engineer a whole bunch of different properties, things like the adhesion, lubrication, uh, the wettability, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, uh, even corrosion properties. There are self-assembled monolayers that will prevent corrosion. Um, and of course, you know, for biomems devices, protein adsorption. Uh, they can also be functionalized with biorecognition molecules. I mentioned RGD peptides. There are even molecules that are even more specific than that. There are molecules which will, um, which will only attach to certain cell types. For example, if you're flowing, um, if you're flowing uh, uh, an environmental sample through a microfluidic device and you want to capture just the bacteria cells, you can actually put a certain biorecognition molecule on the surface that will only capture the E. coli or the bacteria cells and it'll, less, it'll let everything else pass right through. You can get very specific with these uh, recognition molecules. And those recognition molecules would be attached to this part of the self-assembled monolayer. 
And by doing that, they, the attachment molecules will be attached to the surface, and then the proteins would then attach themselves, or the organisms, the E. coli, would attach themselves here. So it's a way of capturing, uh, capturing uh, organisms and um, uh, biomolecules on a surface. Now another thing about self-assembled modelers, I guess we'll talk about that in a, in a second, um, is that they can also be removed. Let's say you want to pattern the self-assembled modeler. In the sense, you want some areas to contain the SAM, other areas you do not want, want to have it. Okay? You can um, do plasma uh, oxidation. You know, we talked about RI, things like RAE, plasma, ex, um, plasma etching. Um, if you expose self-assembled modelers to ultraviolet light, that will kill the self-assembled monolayer, and then if you just wash, um, if you just wash the thing afterwards, then they'll wash right off. So you can use light and oxidation to pattern self-assembled monolayers to get certain regions and other ones to not have certain regions. So these are examples of, um, uh, uh, sorry, this is an example of how you can pattern self-assembled monolayers and proteins using microcontact printing. So we talked about this in the last uh, module where you have basically have a stamp. You dip the stamp in uh, a solution and then you, you stamp your surface. It's very much like the hand stamps that you'd get at, a, at an amusement park. Uh, so uh, you can use these uh, PDMS stamps to print alkane thiol um, uh, groups uh, on a metal layer. For example, you know here we have... Uh, You know, we designed, um, you can have a certain pattern that you design, so you create your stamp from that pattern. You dip this PDMS into a beaker containing your self-assembled monolayer solution, so it's coated with the, with the solution of this uh, uh, self-assembled monolayer molecules, and then you bring it in contact with the silicon substrate that has metal on top of it, so this would be gold. Okay, so only in the regions that came into contact will have the self-assembled model layer formed on it. And remember, once, once these molecules come in contact with the surface, they form covalent bonds, a relatively strong bond. So um, after you remove the PDMS and then you wash this whole thing to wash up any excess molecules, you have a nice single layer of this model layer on, um, on top of your device. And the PDMS can be used to basically pattern those regions. This is an example of patterning that was done with, um, uh, with this type of technique. Uh, now, what they did here was that they, uh, uh, um, they patterned an etch mask. So they put down a self solid monolayer that repelled silver etchant. Okay, so in their case, the metal layer was silver. And what they patterned on top of there using the stamp was a self-assembled model layer that, that resisted the silver etching chemical. So the silver, it, it was basically acting as photoresist. So the regions that were not covered by the self-assembled model layer etched away, leaving behind a pattern like this. Now this is, think about this, this is a really cool way to uh, uh, pattern materials because you didn't need to do any photolithography. Once you created the stamp, then you could basically stamp um, your photoresist, well, something that was acting like photoresist, onto uh, a metal surface and use that to etch the surfaces. So this is a, a poor man's lithography, if you will. Yes? Um, what is that, the red layer on the PDM? The PDM, this is the, the self-assembled model layer. So you take the, the self-assembled model layer, remember, it's just, it's in a beaker, it's a solution. So you take this PDMS stamp and you dip it into the solution, and so that forms a nice, uh, like a coating. And when you stamp the PDMS onto the surface, some of this, these molecules are transferred to the surface here, and they form the covalent bond. And the rest are rinsed away. Okay, so the same technique can also be used to pattern proteins also. All right, in this case, you have, again, you make a PDMS stamp, I'm not going to go into the details of that since we've already talked about that. And then um, you can microcontact uh, uh, a protein here. So, 
um, this, this part here does not have to do with self assembled model errors, just to clarify. This is where you're just directly printing protein on the surface of glass. Now, proteins fizzysorb onto the surface of glass because glass has a charged surface. Proteins which are charged will interact with that surface and it'll, it won't form a covalent bond, but it will adsorb to the surface. It'll sort of attach to the surface due to the fizzysorption. Um, does it need to be pushed hard to the glass? Yeah. No, no, the proteins just need to be, the, the solution just needs to, you just need to have the solution of proteins on, on the surface of the glass. The proteins will attach themselves. No pressure. That, that's, that's a good question. All right. Now, just one small detail. If you remember, PDMS is hydrophobic. It's actually water repelling. If we want, you, if we want a thin layer of this um, uh, an aqueous solution to be on PDMS, we actually have to treat the PDMS to make it hydrophilic. You can do that by putting it under a, a oxygen plasma. If you guys remember from the lab um, when you went in and saw how to make PDMS devices, uh, you remember there was that something called a Corona bonder. It was basically shooting out sparks from it. Okay, those uh, those sparks actually uh, render the surface of PDMS hydrophilic. Okay, so if you if you want uh, if you want your stamp to work properly, you have to make your PDMS hydrophilic. All right. So you see, this is a, a, a different category of techniques for patterning surfaces. There's no photoresist involved here. There's no development involved here. We're literally stamping uh, chemistry patterns, making some regions hydrophilic, some regions hydrophobic, some regions uh, um, that will etch, will allow a silver etchant to go through, some regions that, will, that won't, some regions which will allow proteins to stick, other regions which, which don't. So it's a, it's a different way of thinking about the fabrication. So I mentioned there's going to be a little bit more chemistry in this module. So he, here's a little bit of that, um, little bit of that chemistry. Uh, do do we want to take a few minute break here, or should we just continue? Okay, yeah, let's take a let's take a short break, and then we'll continue. So, yeah, like I said, a little bit of chemistry for understanding how you can attach proteins to self-assembled model layers. So the idea was that, uh, uh, you know, self-assembled model layer attaches to a metal surface or a glass surface. You can pattern self-assembled model layers. So certain regions will attach, certain regions will not, or certain regions will form the, the, the self-assembled model layer, other regions will not. Now we're talking about this, okay? How can we attach different protein groups to this end of the self cellular model layer so that we can, for example, we can uh, um, attach certain cell types, we can attach certain types of proteins but not others. Okay, so there's a little bit of chemistry involved here that we can uh, try to understand a little bit here. So cross-linkers can attach uh, proteins to self-assembled monolayers. So this was a self-assembled monolayer. Cross-linker is sort of a mediator, if you will. It will help attach a certain type of protein to the top of this. Okay. Um, now that protein could be the, the protein that you would like to capture. That protein could be a molecule that attaches a certain type of, type of cell that you're interested in, in attaching. So there's obviously a lot of reasons why we want to do that. But you need to have these uh, cross-linkers. Okay, cross-linker uh, molecules act as middlemen. They help attach biomolecules to the, uh, um, the terminal groups of self-assembled monolayers. The two types, there's a heterobifunctional that have different groups at each end, and then there's a homobifunctional that have the same functional group at both ends. Uh, this just has to do with the structure of the molecule. Let me back this up a little bit. It's a little bit larger. It's examples of uh, different functional reactive groups. Um, these are some of the uh, better known ones. Uh, probably the most available and the most, uh, uh, one of the cheapest, 
is um, uh, aldehydes. So aldehydes are a group of chemicals, this is an example of glutaraldehyde, that react with amine groups. So an example of this is that the, um, this aldehyde reacts with amine groups, so if the self-assembled monolayer, if this terminal function group, functional group had an amine group at the end, then this end would attach to that. And this other amine end, this other part here, could attach to another amine molecule. Turns out proteins are, uh, proteins have a lot of amine groups on them. So a protein that has an amine group would attach to this end of the molecule. So this is, this aldehyde, the glutaraldehyde is serving as a middleman. Okay. Uh, a protein with amine groups wouldn't attach, would not attach to this directly. But in the presence, if you first attach the glutaraldehyde, one end, like I said, one end of this glutaraldehyde attaches to the SAM, the other one attaches to the protein molecule. Um, this works well because, number one, it's, it's cheap and, and all proteins have amine groups on them. Okay, so it's pretty universal. Uh, another example here is uh, the NHS esters. Okay, there's a, um, a long chemical name for this, but I, uh, you know, that, that's not... And important. Uh, these also react with uh, amine groups at a slightly uh, basic uh, pH, and uh, the the malamido groups react selectively with uh, thiol groups, but not with amine groups. Okay, thiol groups have a sulfur bond. Um, amine groups have a nitrogen in them. Uh, yeah, I have I have them a little bit on the next slide here. So depending on what types of proteins you would like to attach, you, may, you might consider using aldehydes or you might consider using these or these. Uh, another aspect of this is that sometimes we may want the cross-linking or the attachment to happen when we irradiate the material with light. So remember last module we were talking about uh, photolithography, you know, where light is being used to pattern photoresist it's a light activated chemical reaction. In the case of photoresist, the light activated reaction was making the photoresist soluble. In this case, what you can do with photoreactive crosslinkers is that you can activate the crosslinking reaction, meaning that the proteins will attach to the crosslinker if you irradiate it with light. It's light activated. So by doing this, you can actually pattern, by patterning the light, you could pattern which regions the proteins will attach. And that's why photoreactive crosslinkers are interesting. It can be used for lithographic uh, patterning. There's a couple uh, linkers here. There's, there's actually a huge library of these. We're only just covering just a few examples so, you, so that you know they exist. If you go to any of the, um, you know, Sigma Aldrich or um, uh, some of the, like Thermo Fisher, any of these, a lot of these websites that sell these types of chemicals, you'll see that they have huge catalogs of cross-linker chemistries, um, you know, which can uh, attach to different types of proteins, different areas within proteins, and so on. Uh, there, you know, when we're talking about photoreactive cross-linkers, there's a lot of, um, you know, different um, cross-linkers will respond to different wavelengths of light. Um, some of the, uh, you know, one example that was mentioned in the book is uh, benzophenones. Uh, so this, this particular example has uh, the malamido group in it. This is the, the, the functional reactive group, so that's chosen from here. And this portion here is the, um, the photoreactive part of it. This, this is what gives it its, um, um, this is what makes it sensitive to light. So in both of these examples, the green boxes here are showing you which part of the molecule makes it sensitive to light. Okay, in the second example, you have this azide group. This makes it sensitive to light. And in the case of the first one, the benzophenone, this portion here makes it sensitive to light. So you need to, if you want to make a, cro a photoactive crosslinker, you have to have a portion that's uh, uh, sensitive to light, and then the other portion of it is the one that's actually involved in the crosslinking reaction. In the case, uh, in this first case here, the malamido group, these two groups hanging off the end here, these are what react with the um, 
with the with the thiol groups. Okay. So if you want a thiol cross-linking, you can use this molecule when you activate it with light, then the thiol chemistries, these things will be activated and they will um, uh, cause the cross-linking to occur. In this example, you have an azide group, which um, I don't remember which wavelengths this is activated at. I, I think it was ultraviolet light, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. And in this case, the thing that is actually causing the reaction is the ester group, which and this ester group will, will help cross-link uh, amine groups together. Okay. Um, this is, I added this slide um, just before class actually today just so you can see an example of how cross-linkers attach proteins. A little bit more specifics of it. Um, I talked to you guys about the structure of cells so it's worth it to briefly mention the structure of proteins as well. Uh, cells, um, you know, uh, proteins are you know, it's more or less the, the basic building block in your body, you know, your your body is made up of uh, uh, made up of various types of proteins. The proteins do different functions in your body. Everything from, you know, enzymatic reactions involved in the digestion of food. Um, there are certain types of proteins that maintain maintain the structure of your body. There are proteins involved in uh, chemical pathways that you know how how you, you know, uh, in, involved in things like uh, digestion, circulation, e every part of your body is, uh, there's proteins involved. Okay. Uh, but the, the structure of proteins uh, looks something like this. And pr proteins are made up of amino acids. Okay, there's a, uh, uh, zoom in here. Proteins are made up of different amino acids. There's uh, 20 or 30 different amino acids that are out there. And, and uh, these amino acids are strung together, literally, into like, you know, one right after another. So uh, you can think of proteins as like, a, a, you know, a beaded necklace, if you will. Each one of the beads is an amino acid, and they're strung together by a chemical backbone that connects those amino acids together. Okay. This is another reason why you know these things are called polymers. Okay. This is one mer. Okay. This is one a component of it. A polymer means you have multiple things that are strung together. All right. In this case, the individual things are amino acids. All right. So it starts off as sort of a, a, these uh, amino acids that are attached together. So it's like a string. Um, but interactions between these different amino acids, for example, certain amino acids might be attracted to other amino acids. This causes the string to actually form like secondary structures and tertiary structures and even quaternary structures. Okay, so literally like this string like twists upon itself because different, if you imagine like different, a beaded necklace, right? One bead is in the necklace is attracted to the other bead. Though if those molecules come together and attach themselves, then now you no longer have a straight beaded necklace, you have a twist in it. Right? So these interactions between these amino acid residues causes what is initially like just a basic string to form secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary structures. This is called protein folding. Okay, So after a protein folds, it can form all sorts of complex shapes. And it turns out that shape is extremely important. Biologists will say structure determines function. It's a basic dogma in biology that the shape of a protein, the structure of a protein is what determines what it can do in the body. Certain enzymes, for example, enzymes that are involved in digestion um, or enzyme, things that are involved in enzymatic reactions within the cell, um, certain enzymes will only react with certain substrates because the enzyme has a certain shape. The molecule that the enzyme reacts with fits nicely into a certain region of the enzyme. Proteins and enzymes are the same thing, by the way. I, I hope I don't confuse you there. So an enzyme is a protein that's involved in a chemical reaction. So the shape of the protein might be such that it fits, uh, uh, fits a glucose molecule nicely. Okay, so then it will, it will react with a glucose molecule because the, the glucose molecule fits into that structure very nicely. Okay. The shape of a protein is very important in, in how it, uh, what it does, how it functions. Right, so it's a little bit about protein structure here. Now, um, 
uh, the, the, the topic of the slide was how do crosslinkers actually attach these proteins? Well, you can imagine that um, you have all these different amino acid, resid acid residues. If you have a chemistry that will attach to a certain amino acid, for example, that's one way to anchor something to a protein. So a crosslinker will typically attach to, um, you know, you can attach a self assembled monolayer to the protein by using a crosslinker, as we mentioned on the previous slide. And the way the chemistries might work is that on the protein side of things, proteins, um, you know, you'll try to form bonds within amine groups that, that are contained in the proteins. Proteins also contain like carboxyl groups, sulfhydryl groups, carbonyl groups. These are different chemistries that are that that are often part of proteins. All right, these protein these uh, chemistries can be used to attach a molecule to a protein. And you know, it can also be used to attach a protein to a surface. Uh, just one example here. Like I said, there's tons of examples out there. You know, there's a whole handbook here if you'd like to see just one vendor. Life Technologies has a, a handbook of different cross-linking uh, chemistries. Um, on the last slide, I mentioned that one of the cross-linkers was NHS ester. So this is what the reagent looks like. So, so this is the cross-linking molecule. Now what we want to do is we would like to attach R to P. This is the protein, so you can imagine that R is that terminal group on the self-assembled monolayer, and P is the protein that we'd like to attach to the self-assembled monolayer. So um, you start off with this, and this is the a reagent. This has the R group on it, and then you add it to the protein. Now the reaction that happens is that the, the, ester, the NHS ester reacts with amine groups at elevated pHs. So when you have these two things together in the presence of a higher pH, um, this forms an amide bond between the R group and the protein. So you've attached them together with the help of this NHS ester. Okay, and then it, it pops off like, you know, this part of it is released. So this is sort of like a byproduct. Okay. The point is that, that this crosslinker molecule was essential in the chemistry of binding it helped bind together, it helped it glue together this R and the P. Okay. So these are intermediary molecules that help a certain binding and attachment to happen. Uh, let's see. Let's get through these next few slides here. Um, so we talked about self assembled monolayers. You could have mixed self assembled monolayers where you have multiple. Uh, multiple self-assembled monolayer molecules that are assembled together. Uh, for example, um, in this example here, we have a, a, a peg thiol mixed self-assembled monolayer that resists uh, protein adsorption. So some of the self-assembled monolayer uh, uh, molecules, you can see that some are in blue and another type of molecule is shown in green. Okay, each one of these has a different chemistry. Uh, this, the green ones are methyl terminated, the other ones are um, a PEG terminated. But this end of it, they're, all, they're similar in this end of it. They, they all have these uh, sulfur groups which form bonds with the metal underneath it. All right, so mixed self-assembled monolayers can be useful in things like uh, where you want to have certain regions where the protein attaches, other regions where you don't want the protein to attach. Um, for example, this is one example of a mixed self-assembled monolayer. Some of the self-assembled monolayer molecules have PEG groups attached to the end of it. We'll, we'll talk about that later. PEG is polyethylene glycol. It's like one of those things that it always resists protein. If you want to, you know, if you want to prevent proteins from absorbing to something, the first thing that uh, a bioengineer would think of is, oh, use PEG, polyethylene glycol. Okay, it's... Um, it's just a very popular material for that. So what they did was they, you know, on one end, on the the, um, the functional group end of the self-assembled monolayer, they attached uh, PEG groups to it. So this is a protein-resistant background. And some, some of the self-assembled monolayers have um, 
a ligand instead. This ligand is designed to attach proteins. For example, the RGD sequence will help proteins attach to it, or glutaraldehyde crosslinker will help proteins attach to it. So um, you can combine something that helps proteins absorb with something that prevents proteins from absorbing. So by doing, by combining the two types, you'll get um, you'll get a very a nice contrast between the regions where proteins absorb and the regions where they don't. Okay, this shows another example here where you have um, a protein resistant background combined with some regions where, where it's, which is just methyl terminated. This is hydrophobic, so proteins like to absorb there. All right, this is an example of another thing of interpenetrating networks. Let's let's skip over that today, just in the interest of time. So uh, this slide is important. Patterning self some of model layers. Okay, just like we pattern photoresist, just like we pattern metal layers, just like we pattern um, different areas of silicon, we want to be able to pattern self some of model layers. Because we want to say that I want my proteins to go here. I want the cells to attach here. And I don't want them to attach to other places. So that's the reason why we want to pattern them. A uh, few different mechanisms that we can use to pattern um, self sum of model layers here. Um, one is the physical barrier. Okay, If we uh, uh, put some sort of, uh, like, um, maybe even a photoresist coating. Okay, the photoresist coating masks some of the regions, and then we dip this whole thing into the SAM solution. self sum of model layer only uh, assembles in, in the regions that, that are where the surface is exposed, and then you remove this photoresist here. You're left with this, uh, this pattern here. Um, we, we also talked about this, a substrate pattern. So let's say you, you used photolithography to pattern uh, the gold layer. Okay, so you just have these little patches of gold, okay, regions of gold. Self-assembled model layers, if you use an alkane thiol, or if you, if you use a thiol-based self-assembled model layer, those molecules only attach to gold. So these molecules then only attach to where the gold surfaces were patterned. Okay, and that's another way you can get the, um, a pattern self-assembled model layer here. A third approach we just talked about is the microstamping with PDMS. Okay, so you'd have the metal surface on, throughout the entire thing, and you only um, bring the self-assembled monolayer molecules in contact with it in certain places. That's a microstamping approach. And the last approach is ultraviolet radiation. So let's say you first deposit the self-assembled monolayer everywhere. So it, it forms a monolayer everywhere, and then you selectively irradiate certain regions with ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light will disrupt the bonding between the self-assembled model layer and the surface. So that's another way you can get a pattern of self-assembled model layers on the surface. Many different approaches depending on, you know, depending on your fabrication process. Uh, we'll end with this slide. Um, this is an example of uh, self-assembled mo model layer patterning with a physical barrier. So this is showing this example here. Now, we already saw examples of microstamping and sub, um, substrate patterning. We haven't yet, but you, you get the idea. So this is the first self-assembled monolayer pattern um, demonstrated by uh, Bell Labs in 1988. As you know, <coughs> Bell Labs was like a very, uh, uh, you know, an excellent research organization in the United States. Unfortunately, recently they, they closed down in the last few years due to funding issues. But they, they've done some great work in all areas of science. Um, so what they want to do here is they want to pattern cells on a surface using self-assembled monolayers. They want the cells to attach to certain regions but not to others. So they did two um, photolithography steps in this one. In the first step, okay, so you start off with the silicon, you spin coat photoresist, you develop the photoresist, so now you have the lithographically defined surface. Now you dip this whole thing into, um, into a solution that contains this self-assembled layer molecule, alkyl trichlorosilane. The silane portion of the molecule attaches to the glass surface or the silicon surface, and the alkyl portion of it is the region that's, that's left exposed on the top. So these alkyl regions are hydrophobic, and um, it will deter cells from attaching to them. 
So after they stripped the photoresist, they have they now have certain regions that were um, a patterned um, hydro hydrophobic. Now what they do is is they dip this entire thing into another self-assembled monolayer solution consisting of amino trihydroxysilane. Again, the silane groups attach themselves to the surface, but only in the places which are not already occupied by the previous self-assembled monolayer. So now you have uh, um, the second layer, if you will, uh, that which is N plus terminated, right next to regions where this is um, alkyl terminated. So um, the uh, uh, these N plus groups, these amino silanes, they simulate poly D lysine, which is a common neuron adhesive substrate. So in other words, these N plus regions allow the cells, the neurons to attach to them. And so when they take a surface like this, you know, you have a flat surface to, to our, our naked eye or to, you know, even in a microscope, we won't be able to see the difference between those regions. Okay. But when you, if you were to put a solution of cells on top of that, uh, if you just let a solution of cells grow on top of that, the cells will selectively attach to the regions that are N+. Plus. They will not attach to the, uh, to the alkyl uh, terminated regions. So you get these really beautiful patterns where the cells literally grow based on the areas that they were given. So this brings us back to you know, this concept here. Remember I was saying that cells will spread onto surfaces that they like? using these focal adhesion points. Well, if you pattern the surface into a certain shape, the cell will actually take the shape of that surface. So in, the, in this case, they were uh, showing that if you pattern this grid pattern, the cells will um, literally grow, the neurons will literally grow along those tracks. And they'll form these long shapes rather than forming their regular structures. Okay, so. You know, the reason we're talking so much about surface chemistry, this is one example of it. Biologists like to use biomems devices to study biology. And it turns out this is one of those things where, where the surface patterning actually enables you to study biology in a new way. Before this, biologists had no way to actually um, twist and turn a, sh a cell into different shapes. Um, so this is a way that they have to do that. Now, um, we're going to cover this next class period. I'm going to let you go now. But um, just so you can see that uh, uh, new biology can actually be discovered uh, using microfabrication. This is a famous paper that was published in Science, uh, which was called Geometric Control of Cell Fate and Function. They basically patterned a whole bunch of adhesive islands here. So these regions were patterned with adhesive proteins, and the other regions were not patterned. So it turns out that the cell cells will spread into these islands, okay, and if um, in order for the cell to survive, the size of the island has to be large enough. Okay, cells that were patterned on a five micron island, these cells did not attach. Cells that were patterned on a ten micron island were able to attach, but they did not survive. And cells that were on these larger islands, they were actually able to to uh, attach themselves and survive. Okay, they actually were controlling biology at the single cell level using these microfabrication techniques, surface properties. Very, very cool stuff. Um, Jeremy, do you have a question? I, I was just wondering if they determined why at below the 20 micron level they didn't survive. Ah, good, yeah, the reason why, you, yeah, you can see here that the um, uh, uh, below, uh, below a certain size, the, apop, the number of um, apoptosed cells, the cells that committed suicide, went way up. Okay, it turns out that you know cell biology is there's cells are incredibly complex uh, systems that can respond to all sorts of external stimuli. They're very aware of what's going on around them. Uh, one mechanism is through these focal adhesion points. If it doesn't have a certain number of focal adhesion points that actually, these focal adhesion points I mentioned, they're connected to the inside of the cell. The cell will actually start doing signaling cascades. It'll tell itself to kill itself because it doesn't, it doesn't have enough focal adhesions. That, that brings us to back to this concept here, that cells that don't attach properly, they will, they'll die.
So these cells are very, it's really amazing what these, um, there's so much signaling and so many interesting things happening here. So yeah, we're, we're kind of scratching the surface a little bit on um, cell biology and surface chemistry, but, you know, starting to give you an idea. So we're over today. Let's, um, let's continue this discussion on Wednesday. Uh, please make sure you bring your homeworks on uh, the beginning of, uh, beginning of Wednesday. All right. Thank you.